Did you help me put her to bed? Sorry, babe. I don't have time right now. I'm right in the middle of something. Mike does that to me all the time, too. Man, I don't have time for this. This is the series we're in. Some of you guys are like, I don't have time for this. But you're here on a three-day weekend. It's great to see you guys. Uh, Whitewater is a place you can belong before you believe, which means you don't have to believe what I believe or um, what people in our church believe. We just want you to have a place you can explore faith, build friendships, and learn to move uh, toward Jesus at your own pace. Um, I want to share something for you, with you guys so I don't forget, but next week we have something really special. There's a, just a wonderful couple in our, in our church, Brandon and Abby Wenzel, and uh, they actually are going to be here next week. We're going to be doing an interview with them, and they're going to share what God has been doing in their life since a major event. Some of you guys have heard this and know about this, but in their life, they, they almost lost their little daughter, Lily. And God miraculously, just in some incredible ways, saved her life. And, uh, and it's just been this thing that's been happening in and God's been doing in our, uh, the life of our church and in their life. Um, but it, they, they've been on the other side of this. And we just want to know, what, what has God been doing and teaching them since all of that happened? Because life continues going on. How are they doing spiritually? What have they learned? What's God been teaching them? How's Lily? And we just thought that would be such a cool uh, thing to do this next week. And so if you have friends that might be interested in a story of hope and God's power, um, I would encourage you to come on out. These are real people and they love Love, love Jesus. So I want you guys to know about that. Why don't we pray and we'll jump right in. Heavenly Father, thank you so much uh, that we could come here today and gather um, in freedom, in forgiveness, and Lord, in total grace. I just pray that, would you quiet the the worries and the, the, you know, anxious voices that can crowd our minds sometimes? Would you just quiet our heart? Would you help us to sit here and rest in you, God? I pray that you would speak to us in a way that you'd get our attention, Lord. And the words that are said today uh, don't matter if there's no change. God, I pray that our hearts would be open to the change you want us to make, Lord. And so bring that freedom, bring that empowerment uh, this morning. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So the la- last week we covered uh, and started the, the subject of I don't have time for rest. Um, We've done I Don't Have Time for Healing. We kicked off this series, but we thought this, uh, this subject would qu- require two weeks to really get into because we live in a busy and, well, a very busy and crazy world. Uh, Psalm 127 uh, verse 2 says this, It's useless to rise early and go to bed late and work your worried fingers to the bo- bone and then get up again and do it again and then get up again, and then do it again. It says it's useless to do that. Don't you know that God enjoys giving rest to those he loves? And in my life, sometimes you could look at my actions, and I know that I could be moving at such a pace. The the answer to that question, don't you know that God loves to give you rest? And it's like, well, I don't act like it sometimes. I act sometimes like everything depends on me. And I think so many people are, are... burden and carrying heavy weights that even in this room and in our world are just moving at a frantic pace. They can barely even think like life is just reaction. It's not thought through. There's no reflection. It's just reaction. And we're going from thing to thing to thing. And we're trying to find rest in all the wrong places. And when we have exhaustion, we're bringing our exhaustion to our vices and our devices. We can be bringing it to our addictions and our, our, our lesser um, uh, our, the, the desires of our life that we wish we didn't have, and we're bringing it there, or we're on our phones all the time, bringing our exhaustion there. And we've been asking, how do we learn to bring our exhaustion to Jesus? How do we find rest in a restless world? Jesus says this in Matthew 11. This was a primary uh, verse last week. This is a, I want it to be a foundation for us again. Jesus says this, Come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Is there anybody here today that can relate to feeling weary and burdened? All right? Are there any parents in the house? Okay, there's a few. Uh, Are there any grandparents in the house? You're like, I put the work to get that parent here. Um, Singles, trying to figure it out in this mad, crazy world. Any singles here? 
right? Hey, don't look around at each other. That makes it even more <laughs> like, I'm single. I'm here. <laughs> Patrick, I'm just joking with you, man. But he is single, I think. Anyways. Uh, <laughs> but we can be moving at such a frantic pace. It's like, we don't think we have time for this or that, but really what's going on in our life is we don't have time for the most important things. We have time for everything else. Jesus says, come to me, you, like us. This still echoes into our day and age. Jesus is saying to you and to me, uh, come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened, and it's an invitation. Jesus, it doesn't say you have to or stay away from me, you who are weary and burdened and are going to be a burden to me. Jesus isn't afraid of our burdens. He's not afraid of the worries and the weights that we carry. He says, come to me as an invitation and I will give you rest. And it's interesting, he doesn't say, come to me and I'll make you give you rest. He says, I will give you rest. I... I, after service, after first service, I was talking with a gentleman. He, he gave me permission to share this. And, and we were just talking about just how frantic and um, weary people can get. He was just like, man, I, like, I was working this crazy job, crazy hours. It was completely unhealthy. Um, my boss knew it was unhealthy. My, the workers there knew it was unhealthy. And the, the pace was really unhealthy. And it caused other things to be unhealthy. And he's like, I, I'd just get home. And, and me and my wife were, would try to connect. But I'm trying to just get things done that I hadn't been able to do because I've been working so much. And I was working extra days and extra hours. And I wasn't seeing my family. And he's like, I was just... I remember he's like, I, I, we started to get an argument about being present and being together and helping around. And, and he's like, all of a sudden, I just broke. He's like, we were in survival mode. And like we were, we were on this hamster wheel just going and going and going. And, and we didn't even know how do you break out of that survival mode. How do, you, how do you know something different? And he's like, something had to change for us. And he's like, I, he's like this series is really, it, it's highlighted for me just how, how much I need to, to make sure that I'm, I am taking a break but sometimes I am just withdrawing from things so I can get my priorities straight so I can know which way's up and which way's down anybody feel like that my um my my dad when he went through uh his 20s 30s and 40s there were these stages of of um, aging and development that we saw one of them was his beard which was blonde and red and brown had all the different colors in it and then slowly from 20 to 30 he started getting the white up front i'm starting to get that here and then in his 40s it really started going white and now it's like almost all white um that's been the progression you see and other than that he looks the same his hair is the same color People think he dyes his hair, but he doesn't. Um, at least he has hair. Um, the other thing uh, we noticed growing up with him was um, his snoring changed at de- every de- decade. The first uh, decade, it was kind of like this. <laughs> this kind of even snoring. If you guys have dads who'd snore, so when we go camping, you go to the hotel, you know, like dad's around. He'd kind of keep us up, and he had this regular. <laughs> that's what it sounded like. And then in, in, that's his 20s. And then in his 30s, it was kind of this like. You guys, that's probably terrible, and I apologize to our viewers online today, but, and then, you know, like, you'd be at the, you know, sleeping together at the, you know, a tent trailer or whatever. (laughs) In his 40s, it took a real turn. It was, all of a sudden, it went from, like, that steady to, like, this, like, And we'd all be like, oh, Dad, are you okay? We'd be like, what's wrong? And you just go back to sleep. And we'd all just be like, is he going to live? He's going to make it through the night? And we'd be in these tent, you know, like, like campsites. And you, you, we'd have tent, tenors around us that were like listening to, and like, is this guy going to be okay? He'd be like, and they're like, oh, breathe. Are you going to be okay? Breathe. Um, and we found out it was this thing called sleep apnea. You know, this thing they invented in the early 2000s for people. And, <laughs> and he was like, he, he, every time he would rest or sleep, he was actually getting more unrested because of lack of oxygen and like, well, the lack of oxygen was the main thing. But then it would just, it would wake him up all the time. He couldn't like get into REM sleep or you, you get into these deeper modes of sleep. So he, he, was, he was unrested all the time. And we, do we not live in a culture that we could say, has spiritual apnea. 
the more people are trying to rest, the more restless and unrested they feel. The more frustrated they can feel. Like, like instead of um, um, resting from work, Jesus is trying to teach us how to work from a place of rest. How to, instead of just be human doings in a world where like artificial intelligence and robots and all this stuff, it, 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 we, we've, we've invented all these new things, all this incredible technology and um, the world says, well, we're just particles, bits of dust that have come together. You're going to live today and then you're going to be dead and you're just going to live and you're going to die and that's it and there's nothing more. And so people are trying to you know, crush it and find success and win and, and, and they're striving. It's like we've built like these coffins for ourselves and then when we've, we realize we've built ourselves in, we're trying to find rest by like scratching at the coffin ceiling and we can't get out it's like there's nothing we can do about it and here comes Jesus saying let me give you rest let me open the coffin that you built for yourself let me into this um, it's a challenge isn't it how do we not just be human doings but become human beings in a world that wants us to look more and more like robots that don't need rest that continue working all the time, Jesus says, come to me and I will give you rest. He's drawing on this idea of Sabbath, built into the DNA of creation. God created the world in six days, and on the seventh day, he rested. I mentioned this last week, but I think it's worth reminding. Is, was God tired from all he had done? Some of you are like, well, maybe he was. Was the unending source of all life in the universe who can think and, new, and worlds are created, was he exhausted and tired? No. Rest was enjoying creation. And we who are his creation need rest. We're not robots, like my friend Scott likes to say. We're not robots. We're human beings, and, and our rest and our need for rest and uh, energy reminds us that we need God and that we're not designed to just be like these robots. Jesus says, come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened. I will give you rest. Take my yoke. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. That's the idea of be connected to Jesus. In his day and age, everyone was being yoked to some religion, some rabbi, something. And the rabbis of that day and age and the leaders of that day and age were heaping guilt and shame and oppression and all these things on people and just burying them in this. And Jesus is like, come to me, yoke with me, and learn from me. Like, you're going to have to learn. It's going to be an activity. You're not just going to sit passively and do nothing. But you're going to walk with me. You're going to learn from me the way you were designed to be. You're going to move away from the human doing to becoming a human being. Take up my yoke and learn from me. Because I'm lowly and humble of heart. And you will find rest for your souls. You are not a being that is just going to be here a moment like a firefly and then snuff out. You're not just going to exist and then be gone. See, Jesus doesn't teach us that like, oh, life's going to be over very shortly and there's nothing you can do about it. Jesus teaches us that you are an unending spiritual being in God's great universe and there's nothing you can do about that. What do you think about it? It changes everything in the way we live. That you and I have a soul how is your soul like? If I were able to just sit with you and have coffee today, we were just able to go out and have coffee. We're at Starbucks or Anthem or whatever your favorite place is. And I was able to just ask you, how's your soul? What would your answer be? Everything's great. Everything's good. Everything looks great. You know, I haven't connected with my husband or my wife on a real level in months or a year. But everything's good. Everything's great. How's your soul? Like, my work has just consumed my life. It's made me who I am. It, made me, it makes me look successful, but it's consumed everything. I'm about to lose this, this, the things that matter to me. My, I don't have a relationship with my kids. Or I'm worried about my relationship with my kids. I'm seeing, I'm seeing my kids kind of, like, react because of my life. Um, how is your soul? I just went through great loss, like, and I don't know how to process. I don't know how to heal. How is your soul? See, Jesus cares about those things when the world just wants to run past those things. Rest in God and trust him for the rest. That's, that's what we, we studied last week. Jesus is teaching us, trust in, rest in Jesus and trust him for the rest. 
Trust him for the rest of of your worries. Trust him that you will find rest, that you will be filled in him. And so today I want to spend some brief moments um, on why we in our culture are so restless. We covered some, uh, some big things, a divided heart where we yoke ourselves to this religion of work and workaholism or this religion of like just looking good for other people or this, this thing in our life, workaholism, whatever it may be, or a relationship. And we divide ourselves and we divide our hearts and so we get anxious and worried and we're restless. And Jesus says, just seek me first, seek God first. But I wanna, I wanna cover something that's a little different today. I wanna talk a little bit about what does rest look like in our life, and then I wanna give you some reasons biblically for why, what rest can do for your life. Sound good? I'm gonna keep it very simple and practical. But the first thing is this. We didn't talk about this last week, but I think it's so important. Don't miss this. Hang with me for a moment, because it might not seem obvious at first. Jesus said this, a good tree doesn't produce bad fruit. On the other hand, a bad tree doesn't produce good fruit. For each tree is known by its own fruit. So how is, a, how is a tree known? How do you know a tree? Based on its fruit, its foliage, what it produces, right? That tells you what the, what the tree is. Are we talking about trees here? Of course we are. It's, everything Jesus talked about is very literal. Um, anyway, we're talking about people. We're talking about our being. We're talking about our hearts, who we are. Not just what we do, not just what we say. Like those are indications of what? What we do and what we say are indications of who we are. So Jesus goes on, um, he continues to teach. He says, um, figs aren't gathered from thorn bushes uh, or grapes picked from a a bramble bush. A good person produces good out of the good stored up in his heart. An evil person produces evil out of the evil stored up in their heart. For his mouth speaks from the overflow of the heart. Our actions and our words speak from the overflow of what's inside. What do our actions say about us? Now, um, I'm going to introduce a concept to you, and I want to, I want to read something to you. There's a concept in our culture called moral therapeutic deism. You guys familiar with this term? You're like, yeah, yeah, I totally get it. Call my kids that all the time. You moralistic, therapeutic deist. So what that simply is, is it's, it's a generation of people who have an idea that there's a God out there, a God type of thing out there, that they only need or rely on when they need him to feel morally okay and to feel emotionally okay. Other than that, they don't need God or want God in their life. And so that's the dynamic. So they believe in a God type thing that can give them what they want when they want. So many Christians, when I look at this passage that says, you'll know people by their fruit, here's what I think. Many Christians are weary and hurried and restless because they are moral uh, therapeutic deists who use Jesus, now hone in here, who use Jesus to feel good and look good without actually becoming good. They use Jesus, they use the idea of God to feel good and look good to others without actually becoming good because they think that as long as the fruit of their life looks good, now hone in here, they think that as long as the fruit of their life looks good, it doesn't need to taste good. But God is not fooled, and they never find rest for their souls. They think as long as the fruit of their life looks good to the world, it doesn't have to taste good. But they are never finding rest for their souls. Why would someone who's living in a fashion that we just described, which is, I think, a lot of the world we live in in America, why do they never find rest for their souls? Because all of your energy gets put into like, I gotta have this fruit. Like if you're a tree, I gotta have fruit that makes it look like I'm good. And and here's the thing, in our culture, we don't want, like we might say we want vulnerability, we might say, oh, I love authenticity, but authenticity can be used as a veneer to be very uh, disingenuous, inauthentic. Like I love authenticity for other people, 
as I hide behind my layers of life and work and social media and whatever it is, these layers, we can hide behind these things. And what ends up happening is we put all this energy into like putting fake fruit to make us look like we're good trees when we're not, when we're unhealthy and we move at an unhealthy pace. But we need to make the world see that we're, so here's kind of what it looks like. It'll look uh, something like, um, let's put the, the fruit of happiness. I just want to be really happy. Our, our country's based on that, the pursuit of life, liberty, and Happiness, right? So I'm going to be happy. How many people in this room have just pursued happiness for its own sake and found that they're very happy? We live in a world where everyone's like seeking happiness in all these places and no one's happy because happiness is not an end into itself. You and I are made for meaning and purpose, and that means risk and taking like responsibility and committing our lives to something and failing sometimes and not having it go well. Guys, that's where we find meaning and joy and happiness are in those moments. You can't just find happiness by going and buying at the store or, or like working for it all day and just and you know over and over and over and over and like that's going to give you happiness. Again, we're on that like survivalist hamster wheel. Like we, you and I were designed for something greater, but yet we still put like, I'm happy. Or um, what are some other ones that um, in our culture, I'm successful. I'm a successful parent. See, look how good I am on my social media account. Look how, what, look what I'm doing with my family. Like don't look at my actual life. Don't look at, I actually talk to my kids. Uh, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a successful parent. I'm a successful husband or wife. Like, don't look at how we treat one another. Look at, look at what we've done together, what we post pictures or what we present to others. When behind the scenes, we're not connecting at all. There's deep anger and there's, like, there's, it, there's major issues. Like, we're on the verge of, of, of divorce. We're on the verge of separating. And the, that sometimes in our culture, when you have this, like, the fake fruit versus the real fruit thing, if I fake it, then it, it, we're good. What it ends up doing is the more people put, a, the, more people put the, the fruit out that everything's good, it can sometimes mean that things are getting worse. So what we project is actually the opposite. Any of you guys see this in our world? I mean, I mean, many people would look at Jesus and say, well, what does he know? He lived 2,000 years ago. I think he still hits it pretty stra- like straight on the mark. Well, we just want the, the fruit to taste good, not look good. Um, I'm, a, I'm a compassionate political person. I'm going to put that fruit on me. I'm, I'm a compassionate uh, Democrat. I'm a responsible Republican. I'm a likable libertarian. Whatever your brand of fruit, you know, like, but it's good. And I'm, and I'm, I'm like, I'm the way I'm supposed to be. And, and I'll show people by my comments. Um, and I'll show people by my, my political uh, discussion or whatever, whatever it might be. But God sees beyond that stuff. And no matter what your political persuasion, most people are struggling with the same heart issues. Same sense of dissatisfaction and restlessness. I'm a successful entrepreneur. I'm a successful curator. I curate a very beautifully fake and unfulfilling life. And what I want to ask, friends, is this. What it would happen if we spent as much time learning to be good as we have been pretending to look good? I'm not talking about earning your salvation. See, grace is not a, a, opposed to effort. It's opposed to earning. Earning is an attitude. God, Jesus, wants us to work with him, to participate with him, to grow in grace, to become like Jesus, to learn how to rest, to learn how to love, to learn how to have joy in our life. That's an active participation. What if we put more time or as much time as we have been in faking and appearing good to learning to be good? pretending that we're rested to actually being rested see I think if we had a church filled with people that were like we're not gonna have a veneer we are gonna live authentically we are gonna learn we are gonna fail but we are gonna grow we're gonna be a church that rests in God and trusts him for the rest what would that do in our community if we had a church like that what would that do in a restless unrested crazy world and people come in here and they're like wow these people are actually, they actually are wounded people who are honest about being wounded, but they're finding healing. Wow. 
I can be here. Like the, these, these people are, they're honest with who they are before God. They, they, their souls aren't frantic all the time. They're not perfect people, but their souls aren't frantic. I, maybe my soul could become whole like theirs. I just think it changes the game. You guys with me on this? Why would you allow the shallow expectations of the world, your desires, and the devil cheat you and people you care about from the real you? See, what happens is when we believe the lie and we do the fake fruit thing, we, we cheat ourselves from God's best. We're saying, God, you didn't design me good enough. I'm not who I should be. I'm not becoming who I should be. I don't like who I am, so I'm going to fake something else. And what we do is we deny the image of God in us, that he designed you as you are to be an impact in the world. Only you can be you. Nobody else can be you. And when we rest in God, we rest in who he's made us. Everything we are and everything we're not. And I like if, if you're anything like People I know on this planet, including myself, it's so easy to compare ourselves. Man, that tree looks way better than me. That, those fruit over there are incredible. My fruit are just lame. And we start comparing and like we don't become the tree. We don't become the, the person God designed us to be. And he wants us to be given away to the world. The only person who wins when you're not you is the devil. So how do we rest? It's by remaining in him. I want to make this point quick, but I want to make it hopefully stick. John 15, 5 says this. Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches. Who's the vine? You guys awake? Who's the vine? Jesus. Who are the branches? Us. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. Remaining, the idea of connect, connection. The old-fashioned term is abiding in me. Those who are connected in God and he connected to them, they remain. That's how real, real fruit happens. Like, you, you ever see a tree like that or you know, some kind of plant or bush and it's like, I got to produce the pear, I got to produce the, ah, pop! You know, and then I got to do, yeah, pop! Like, I've never seen a tree sweating. You ever seen, that'd be very scary. I'd be wondering about someone's uh, state of mind if that were the case. But, but like, that's just ridiculous, right? Gah! Like producing this, like, I gotta just pop this fruit out. You look at, like, a, a, a healthy plant, a healthy tree, it's just the natural outflow of health, of what the tree is. And it's like the slow, undeniable movement to fruit. And that's what God wants for you and me. And the only way that happens is when we realize, oh, Jesus is the vine. We're the branches. We need to remain. We need to be connected to him. Do you know what abiding is? Like in kind of ancient vineyard culture. So when they would plant a vineyard, they'd plant uh, the vines that would grow. And they, what would happen when they would grow, the first year, if my reading and study is correct, they would cut them down to the nub. And then that whole year, they'd let them grow back. And then instead of letting them become fruitful and become like fruit-bearing branches, they would cut them again, like fully down to the nub, like the little stump, again. Whole year, they would grow. And you think, okay, well, now they're going to become fruitful. Now they're going to, nope. Third year, they would cut them again. The vine dresser would come and cut them down to the nub. It was called their abiding season, the season where they rested. And the reason they did it is they didn't use trellises in, in ancient times, um, to let the vines grow, they would have to be strong enough on their own at certain times in history. So what they would do is they, the cutting back, the abiding, was giving them strength. They were getting stronger and stronger so that finally when they did grow, they were strong enough to hold the fruit that was coming. Now, you might be here today, and this might be the one thing you take away. You might be in an abiding season. You might be missing your abiding season and God is cutting things back or you need to cut things back and abide in him and let like the sap like heal and strengthen you so that you're, you're able to hold up the fruit that God is bringing into your life. 
The fruit isn't there yet. God wants to bring this fruit in and through you, through the being of who you are. So you have good fruit. So you have like pears and apples, not like thistles and thorns. You have good fruit. He wants that to produce that in your life, but you're not strong enough right now. And we need to rest, abide, and remain. Amen? Also, when there would be branches that would grow up that wouldn't bear fruit or they'd be dead branches, they would still suck the life force, like the sap, away from the other branches that were bearing fruit. And Jesus teaches that he cuts these off in us. And he teaches us when we abide and when we rest, that's what we're doing. So there might be branches in our life that were like, ah, this is not giving fruit that's going to last. And we need to abide. We need to remain. So rhythms of remaining. We need to divert daily. This is from Rick Warren. I love this quote. Rick says this. Um, if we want to have rhythms of remaining, this, this is simply something that he uses. Divert daily, withdraw weekly, and abandon annually. Divert daily, withdraw weekly, and abandon, abandon annually. We talked uh, last week about two practices. Two practices. Um, solitude and Sabbath. And what I want to uh, encourage us to do is really to be intentional with these things. To, uh, to separate with solitude and celebrate with Sabbath. Um, the way I think about this is like a river. It's like a river that's flowing. Life is like a river. How many of you guys know this? It's always moving, right? It's just going crazy fast. And we are all like, the world we live in, it's like we're in this river and it's just moving. Some of us are trying to swim against the, the, the stream and some of us are swimming with it. We're just moving at, you know, 100 miles a minute. It's just going. Um, Sabbath and solitude, the, these two practices are equated to this when we're in the river. Um, Sabbath is just... Stopping, swimming with and against, and just enjoying. Recognizing, oh, this is the river God made. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to celebrate and have fun. I remember as a kid floating in the river um, in Whatcom Creek, and it was so fun, or jumping into it from the, from the cliffs, and we just hit the water, and we'd float in this thing. Um, it's so fun when you can just relax and enjoy. And we live in such busy, crazy-paced life. Like We need to be able to Sabbath. Sabbath is, um, it's interesting, it's like a 24-hour period. Like, biblically, it's a 24-hour period. It's a, God made the heavens and the earth. He made uh, everything we have in six days, and on the seventh day, he rested. And he enjoyed his creation. And we were commanded in the great commandments to rest, to celebrate the Sabbath. He, God, do you know God put the Sabbath next to murder and stealing and lying? Like, it's that important? And we'll treat it like, all oh, these other ones are important, but rest isn't. God knows that we need to rest in him, to remind ourselves that we've been in this river, it's crazy, it's moving fast, and we need to enjoy God. And rest might look like going to the beach. It might look like going on a hike. It might look like going, taking a nap. It might look like you know, flying down a water slide with your kids. or what you know, I don't know what rest is for you, but it's a change of pace. And at the end of it, and during it, you're able to say, wow, God, thank you. Wow, God, thank you. And the, the ancient um, Hebrews and, and in Jesus' time, they would celebrate Sabbath as a 24-hour period, like from, Saturday, from Friday night to Saturday night. And Christians picked that up you know, from Saturday night to Sunday night. It was Sabbath. It's time to rest and relax and recreate with your family. And I want to encourage you to take time. Like for me, since I preach and we work as a family and uh, on Sundays, um, we're trying to build in Sabbath as Friday night to Saturday. And there's some areas we're still growing in, but man, we've been doing it. Um, and, and I know when we do it, it's like, it's amazing. And when we do it, we teach our kids. What, what's the difference between telling your kids, you should do this, you should rest, you should do that, and showing them this is what we do? Discipleship, the way of Jesus is more caught than just taught. Like, Jesus said, you can just talk about fruit or you can actually be about fruit. And for, for us, we're trying, to set, we're trying to get better at this in our family. And what would it look like for our church if we said, we're going to set Sabbath. We're going to celebrate it. And, I, and the natural tendency in our day and age is to say, we're, well, we're going to take away from God. We're going to take away, um, you know, so we can rest. We're going to take away God time because we don't want to take away me time and my time. And like, that, that's killing us. We are saying we are so busy 
God, that I, I can cut more out of you and worship of you out of my schedule. No, 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 friends. God wants us to have time with him and a Sabbath. Like it's like the Sabbath prepares us to be able to hear from God. How, those of us who want to hear from God and have moments with God and live our life for God and prioritize around God, how can we do that if we don't take time to Sabbath and break and realize how crazy this world is and to take a break and say, God, you're amazing. Thank you. Speak to me. It's like our ears slowly open up and our eyes open up as we Sabbath. So what I want to encourage you is to, with your family, with your friends, if you're single, with your, with your group, with your spiritual family, your community group, is to schedule out a weekly 24-hour period where you Sabbath. What does that look like for you? What does Sabbath look like for you? Everyone's different in here. What does it look like for you? Where you can say, wow, God, you're incredible. You have joy and you can be human again. Solitude, I'll just spend a moment on this. Solitude is getting out of the river. You've been swimming against the stream, you've been swimming with it, you've been doing all kinds of stuff, you're busy, you're focused, you've got all kinds of things you're trying to accomplish with your life, and solitude is getting out of the river, going to a mountain, going to a cabin, going to a lakeside, and just being alone. And the, have you ever felt like, I need to be doing something I need to be going, I need to have the plan, I need to be reading a book. Like s- solitude, separation with solitude is learning to like not have an agenda. So you can just break away and realize that feeling of like, we, we were talking about it as withdrawals in our staff. It's like you have these withdrawals from doing and having and achieving and relating and talking and hearing and, and just silence. That that. Like those withdrawals are control leaving the body. Those withdrawals are you realizing your motivations, your selfishness, your addictions, your compulsions, and giving it to God. I can't be alone. I can never be alone. I need to be around people. I have to achieve. I have to achieve. All of a sudden, oh wait, God has achieved. I am not God, and God will take care of things without me. The world doesn't spin around without without me there. The world is going to be fine. Um, I'm not alone when I'm with God. It's okay for me to be here with him. And we slow down, we get out of the river, and we see how fast the river has been moving. We realize how exhausted we are. We breathe so that we can get back in. And we're not afraid of the people we're afraid of. We're not afraid of not achieving what we had to achieve. And we can live life with God in a powerful way. Amen? All right, let me close with these thoughts for you. This is Psalms 23. You can get your notes out and just follow this. These are reasons for rest. Reasons for rest. Imagine this as you, before I read this, imagine our church, if we learned, if you took this month and you scheduled out Sabbath once a week, 24 hour period of time. Here's our Sabbath. It's a Saturday, maybe it's a Wednesday, maybe it's Sunday for you and you're, and you, and there's worship time and there's time where you just like Ah, this is rest. Imagine what that would happen in our church. Imagine what your, your summer would look like. What happens in summer in America? We're like, we're, I can't wait to rest. Then we get to the end of summer and we say to everybody, I'm so rested. No, like I'm so tired, right? If we start learning how to rest now, you will be able to rest this summer. That's a good gift. You're welcome. <laughs> it's hard, isn't it? All right, so here we go. I'm gonna finish with this. Uh, rest relates, rest relates. This is when we rest in God. The Lord is my shepherd, uh, David writes. I have all that I need. Rest puts us in a trusting relationship with God that he will take care of us and give us what we need. Rest recreates, it recreates us. He lets me rest in green meadows. He leads me beside peaceful streams. What do we need for spiritual health? Dallas Willard says this, you must ruthlessly eliminate hurry from your life for hurry, get this, hurry is the great enemy of the spiritual life in our world today. Hurry is the enemy of love, you could say. Hurry kills love for God and love for people because love requires time and hurry doesn't have time. Rest renews us. It renews us. 
and it restores us. Verse 3, he renews my strength. Who renews our strength? You, me, Jesus does. God does. Rest redirects us. This is important to me. He guides me along the right paths, bringing honor to his name. Not my name, not your name, to his name. Um, When we've gotten off the path, when we've gotten off the right priorities in our life, rest redirects us to what's most important. And then rest resists. Even when I walk through the darkest valley, I will not be afraid, for you are close beside me. Your rod and your staff protect and comfort me. We become more resistant to fear, more resilient from hurry, worry, flow of business, bringing our exhaustion to our devices, all those things. But when we rest, it helps us resist those compulsions and those addictions. Rest helps you resist temptation. When people are really tired, they make really unwise choices. When people make unwise choices, they often give in to temptation. And what's the cost of temptation? Rest is a buffer. It's, it frees us. It helps us resist leaning away from God and helps us lean toward God. And finally, rest reflects. Surely your goodness and unfailing love, isn't this amazing? God, your goodness, your unfailing love will pursue me all the days of my life and I will live in the, in the house of the Lord. How long? How long? Forever. In reflection, we regain perspective. We can see flowers again. We can see God's hand at work again in our life. When you burn the candle at both ends, you're not as bright as you think you are. I'm not as bright as I think I am. It'll grow your trust in God. You'll set patterns that will bring health to your kids. You'll be able to enjoy summer And the world will be able to see good fruit being produced in front of it. Let's pray, you guys. Father, I just pray for rest on this congregation, on my friends. Lord, for those of us who are struggling with sleep apnea, the spiritual sleep apnea of the soul, Lord, I just, I pray that you would free us from that, that that we would find rest in you. God, bring us joy again. I just know when I'm rested, when my soul is rested, I find I'm thankful again. I'm grateful again. I can see again. I, I have hope again. I have, I have energy. I'm not afraid of things I was afraid of. God, would you give that to our church? What would our church look like in our community? Rested and ready to follow you. I pray that you would ready us through your rest. Amen.